Okay, when you're ready, sir. Go! Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Sean Brown. He's the president and CEO of YCharts. Uh, they make the very attractive charts that you see around on Twitter, social media, blogs. Uh, Sean describes it as a platform for enabling smarter investment decisions. We're going to talk to him right after this. Tobias Carlisle is the founder and principal of Acquires Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquires Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquires Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. Hi, Sean. How are you doing? Hi, Tobias. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Um, what is Y Charts? Well, you just described it pretty well. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, um, we enable smarter investment decisions and better communications. So I like to think of us like a Swiss Army knife. Um, if you just want to stay abreast of the markets, we have, and oh, by the way, I should flag, it's not those crappy Swiss Army knives that break apart when you go to some trade show. It's, it's the really good ones that um, if you, the blade you're looking for is I want to stay abreast on markets. I need a dashboard. I need alerts to tell me what's changed in the market relevant to me. That's a blade we've got. Um, people know us for this word that you just mentioned, charts. It's in our name. We think we're really, really good at visualizations. But behind those visualizations are a lot of really interesting blades like screeners to help you narrow down a list of securities, You know, especially with a guy like you, to, to put a screen on for the acquirer's multiple and get it down to a list of, of select securities. And then you can do some deep dives on those, all, all the way to you know Excel tie-ins, to keep the inevitable spreadsheet up to date, um, to the ability to create and monitor model portfolios, and um, several blades from there. Um, so you've been with YCharts for three years. What was the uh, impetus? What was the reason for joining? So I've become an old man somewhere <laughs> along the way. Happens to I, us all. I, well, it's, it's one of those funny things that when you're younger, you don't realize you're missing this thing called experience. And, and then you come to a point in time where you don't know when you got it, but you seem to have experience. And um, I, I found my way to Y charts three and a half years ago, where um, I was part of a very nice exit when interactive data was sold to ICE, the owners of the New York Stock Exchange. And I had promised my wife we were going to take a bunch of time off and head to your your homeland and, uh, you know, and, and see Brisbane and see all over Australia and see, see the world a little bit more than we already do. And um, literally uh, stumbled upon Y charts, and I just saw it as uh, an opportunity that I could not pass up. So, what, what's your background? Is it finance, or is it data, or is it financial data? What, where did you come from? I, I'm a screwball. That my my I, I started out as a software developer, uh, finance oh, really? finance degree in 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 college. Didn't know much about computers, but I thought uh, the, they were going to change the world. So I became a software developer, got an MBA. Um, went and did some strategy consulting, and then was asked to join a startup as a CFO. So I've basically been a startup or small company grower since then, uh, software, SaaS almost always, and financial services predominantly. That's been a good place to be for the last 15, 20 years. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a fun place. You see this every day. Um, I think financial services is a bit behind other industry segments in the way we take advantage of cheap data, cheap storage, um, commodity data, and easy and great technology for user interfaces. I think we're behind other industries in a way that, the way we apply those to solve meaningful business problems. What, why do so you think that is? Um, I think there's a lot of regulatory yeah. overhang, which dictates, which, which uh, isn't necessarily conducive to innovation. And um, I think there's also a little bit more of it's always been done this way. So what's the real catalyst for change? I and mean, I think maybe some other industries are seeing either existential threats or have less of a regulatory overhang and therefore maybe adopted technology a little quicker. Are you an investor in your own right? Are you a trader or investor or do you, do you dabble in the public markets? I 
I invest my own book. And um, it's an interesting thing for me because the main clientele that we serve are um, wealth advisors and right. asset managers. Um, but my fundamental premise is if I'm really going to understand uh, our target market well, I need to not talk to them only. I need to live like they do. I need to understand what it means to manage a portfolio. So yes, I manage my own book and uh, and love doing that on the side. Um, and, and I figure it's the least I could do to leverage two finance degrees. Yeah. What's your, uh, what's your approach? What's your philosophy? Um, I'm a real buy and hold guy. I'm, I'm, I mean, I have a fundamental bias in everything I do. And, and it starts with me with um, do I like, know, and understand the company and products? And do I have faith in those? So can I visualize the business problem they're solving? And when I get over that hurdle, um, I can take it to the next level and uh, do some fundamental analysis, get comfortable with them, and then put it in my portfolio. And uh, only if I'm doing some tax loss harvesting or things <laughs> like that am I am I likely to dispose of it. Yeah, I've been doing a little bit of that over the last few years. Are you yeah. a uh, is that a Peter Lynch style approach, or what, how do you do? You, who's your uh, investment heroes? Um, I. It, kind of an amalgamation, you know, honestly, and, and, and where I end up gravitating to is I'm a technologist, right? So I, um, I have a, a probably heavier than, than a, a good wealth advisor would advise a proportion of FANG and FANG-like stocks because um, that's, the, that's the world I know really well and uh, um, that and, and, and banking stocks and um, – you know, I, I try to keep a long-term view and don't get too upset when there's a quarterly earnings miss or, you know, a slight blip in the market. You know, one of the, the interesting things that I love using our software for, you know, after 7 p.m. at night is, you know, you, you look at something like uh, Boeing and, and a crash, you know, that they had and, and the 747 MAX being taken from the market. And, and the neat thing about happen to work for a financial research software company is I love to take a look at things like corporate crises and say, what happens after a corporate crisis? What happened after Chipotle had um, an E. coli scare? And I ask questions like this, and then I and my team, we use our software and, and our data to say, hey, is a corporate crisis an opportunity for somebody to buy? Is it an opportunity one to trade? You know, because there there are plenty of opportunities to get, get in and out. That doesn't happen to be what I do. But is it an opportunity to buy and hold for the long term? So I end up using our our research capabilities to help inform some pr approaches I take to buy and hold. And what's your what's your view there on on Boeing and Chipotle? Was it is that is crisis a good time to go and buy? Um, it's it's a great time to buy. Um, especially over the one-year horizon. You're, you're inevitably good companies recover from setbacks. And, and there have been so many, you know, uh, from back in the days, I don't know if you even remember where the uh, Toyota and the pedals were sticking on the, and the accelerators and people were driving through their garage right into their kitchen. <laughs> and, what, um, what, what vintage is that? I, I don't know, but I've stayed away from those cars since then. <laughs> it, it, you better check your license plate. Oh, was, that, and, was that the Prius when the Prius was getting the pedal stuck? You know, I, I can't remember exactly what what yeah. model that is, and, and, and I hope I'm attributing it to the right company. But No, you know, I think that's right. It was the Prius. That was, that's, this is only like in the last five or ten years, right? It's not a, it's not a long time ago. Yeah, and there was the the peanut butter, you know, whether peanut butter had had uh, you know was pollutants it in it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. All those things. Um, I I think good companies recover, and markets forgive and forget. So if you buy to the dip, and the dip usually occurs sometime in the first the the depth of the dip usually has the first thirty to sixty days. We've just found you're going to outperform the market over a one year horizon by a meaningful margin. Yeah, you're a man after my own heart. That's exactly what I go looking for. I, I uh, del I've done it several times, but I learned my, you know, BP. Remember, BP had the spill in the Gulf. Yeah. And I thought you don't want to be at ground zero, so don't buy BP. So I went and looked at all of the, uh, you know, everything sold off, anything that had any exposure, like all of the, yeah. the rig companies and 
anything yeah. that was in there. And they all re- they all recovered a little bit, but nothing did as well as BP, which was right at the absolute ground zero. So that's kind of my philosophy is now is you just got to go in it. Where if you see it yeah. if you see it blowing up, you want to be in in right at ground zero. So that might be BP yeah. or whatever it you might know, be. You know the the funny thing when you mentioned BP is I went to get gas over the weekend with my kids, and um, while I as an investor and the markets have certainly forgiven BP. My children haven't. My, cho- my children, when I pulled up to you know four corners, there's a gas station on each one. The most convenient happened to be BP. My kids are like, Dad, you can't go here. They polluted the, they polluted the oceans. And I said, uh, maybe there's a difference between um, my kids' sentiment and market sentiment. And you know maybe when my kids get a little older, um, market sentiment and and uh, you know uh, age group sentiment may converge a little bit more but the markets have forg- forgiven and forgotten and bp's done great it has done very well it's one of the funny things about you know they say about all the oil companies and all commodities in particular you know there's no branding for the commodity you don't get like the the fuel really isn't that different from any one to the next so there's there's nobody really driving looking for you know nobody's driving looking for the chevron but that's interesting i hadn't considered that before that maybe there is yeah. that overhang and that's the interesting that you're saying, you know, tying this back to um, software and research platforms, much like gas stations, uh, data has become a bit of a commodity, right? So the, the differentiator and the, the thing we have fun with is how do you make developing insights and communicating insights um, unique? And how does that differentiate you? Because there's all kinds of gas station-like commodity data out there what are you going to do to make that easier for people to use so what do you guys do is that do you do you scrub the data at all because that's one of the things that i've found it's very hard to find really reliable data they're almost always riddled with errors this is not even talking about back testing this is, if you can find good back testing data that's one thing but even the real-time data is always like even just the decimal places in the wrong place yeah um, we do try. We, we do a couple of things. One is uh, we try to scrub the data, but we think if we pick the right data provider, largely speaking, a lot of that has been done. Um, we try to do some value adds on top of that data. Uh, a ton of calculations we put on top of that data. Um, we also cultivate or pull from the source a ton of economic indicators. You know, simple things like you're wanting to know the GDP of Sweden. And you're also, for whatever reason, wanting to do a, a graph of the jobs reports and the trend lines there. We cultivate that from the sources and try to make that easy to use. And in and, and a lot of ways, look at that data the same way we do in equities fundamental data. We say if we've got the, the underlying data, um, we can help you compare it, screen off of it, filter it, and develop insights from it. I should say in, in full disclosure, uh, the reason that you're on is because I really like white charts and uh, I've, I've used it at various times. If, if I'm looking for a total return of, an, of a series, often white charts is the only one that has it. And you very cleverly make the, the day that I really want, which is the, the last day, not available for free. So you have to pay for it. So <laughs> you, guys have, you guys have very kindly provided me with the access to that now. So thanks very much for that. I do really do appreciate it. Um, right. Okay. What's the what's the uh, what's the philosophy of Y charts? What are you guys seeking to achieve? Well, uh, if you think about who our target market is, it's um, you know over thirty five hundred. We've got almost five thousand total customers. Thirty five hundred uh, and north of there are wealth advisors and asset managers. Um, we want to make their lives easier. Is ultimately what it comes down to. And and so to to be more specific. Um, we think they're pressed for time, especially the, the the smaller wealth advisors. We think they're pressed for time, and we know their fees are under compression. So we try to make them as badass as possible by finding ways to save them time, finding ways to help them um, improve their investment returns with the fundamental thesis that better research delivers better returns, which helps you justify your fees. And... Um, a, a huge one that we're focused on now is we think advisors do an inadequate job of communicating with their prospects and their customers. One of the big things we're working with advisors on now is, hey, people come to you not because they want to be your best friend. 
and not because you have the best Broadway tickets. They come to you because they have a nest egg that they want you to grow and, and, and manage the risks in growing that. And we think it's imperative that advisors are in regular communication with their customers, not just waiting for a quarterly statement to come out. Um, on a weekly or a monthly basis, what are you, how are you sharing insightful information either on uh, financial education, communicating on FANG stocks, um, you know, what's happened today with Facebook, what happens with the 10 to spread inversion, and how do I, your advisor, what, what, what do I see this as? We just think there's a real opportunity for advisors to communicate much better. So there's a couple of interesting questions there. One, what do you think about the 10 to spread inversion? Well, um, I, I listen to a lot of experts who, you know, have tried to make it clear that's a harbinger of not great things to come. Um, and, and I found in my investing career, I, I spend more time listening to experts who, who have sound uh, opinions on it. But I've also found that uh, experts aren't always right. So my personal opinion is, is uh, it's yet another indicator that this 11 year bull market may uh, may be changing trajectory, but I, I'm not sure, in my opinion, the evidence suggests it's tomorrow, next month, or next quarter. Yeah, I heard uh, Cam Harvey is the, in, uh, the Campbell Harvey is the uh, creator of that. He wrote it as his uh, doctoral dissertation. I think it's his doctoral dissertation, and he was on Meb Faber's podcast, which is a great one as well. And he said, typically, you see it, the impact of it about a quarter later, which should be about now. I think he was on it about June. Yeah, hasn't seemed to have uh, happened yet. And he says it's never missed, which is kind of amazing. But it seems to maybe this maybe this is the time. There's a first time for everything. Oh, you know, it, it's interesting because um, you know even look and, I, and I'm seeing a lot of posts lately about this has been the first decade where there hasn't been, um, you know, there hasn't been any hint of a recession. You haven't been in any kind of recession. And um, it's interesting. We're all making really good use of data and trend lines and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, the, the market continues to prosper. Have you read uh, the, the, the Man Who Solved the Market? Have you read that new book on Jim Simons? I haven't. It's kind of interesting because they're, you know, they're, uh, they started out in a time before there was any good data. They predated Bloomberg being able to supply data, and so they, it was a struggle for. I think they were they actually had to record data on a tick by tick, or or like a daily close, open close, high low kind of basis, mm -hmm. um, because they were they just couldn't get it anywhere else. So they sort of that was one of their early advantages. They actually recorded. It. It's kind of interesting. I think it's it might be something that you'd be interested in because they're they were kind of pioneers in it. And then when, when Bloomberg became available, they sort of, they drew that down pretty hard and th th clearly it's worked for them. They've got absolutely redonkulous returns. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's, and, and you see this more than I do there. There's all kinds of ways to make money in the market. And if there was just one way, we're all smart enough to have followed that one way. And if there was, one guaranteed way, um, you know. Again, we, we we'd be like lemmings. We'd all it, be it'd be gone. I mean, thing. if there'd be one, yeah. if there was one guaranteed way, it'd be arbitraged away. You got The only things yeah. that work consistently are things that don't work for periods of time. Which is that's yeah. why I I'm a value guy. Unfortunately, yeah. it's been a painful decade for value guys. But it's, yeah, with it, any it, luck, it's coming back. It really has. But you know, the, I mean, just again, bringing it to my home front, I have uh, I have a wife of almost 15 years and, and a couple kids and they've got their own investment philosophy. And and it's it's I don't know what you'd call it, the mall philosophy. Mm -hmm. What's going on in either the digital or the physical mall? And they're always like, wow, dad, you need to look at this um, tween or teen girls clothing shop because it's all the rage. And lo and behold, I put it on my tracking list 
And lo and behold, that's skyrocketing. Or to a few years ago when my son said, Dad, you gotta you gotta stop wearing all this Nike gear when you work <laughs> out. You gotta go with, you know, Under Armour. Yeah. And you know, I, I I adopted it and then I saw what it did and I also see what it's done lately. And it, it's interesting. You, you you can go with the gut approach, you can go with the quant approach and not even know what the company does, but know right. what the the technical analysis says and know what the back testing says and you know, that's what I love about the markets. There's all kinds of different ways to win and lose. Yeah, there's a million ways to skin a cat. And I, and I, and you just got to find the one that works for you that you can stick in when it's not working. I think that's yeah. really the best approach. Yeah, uh, my, my, wife, my wife's brother, uh, for Christmas, he was asking for an off-white shirt. Do you know what off-white is? I don't. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a neither do I. Like when he said, <laughs> and this is the mistake we all made because he said, I want an off-white shirt shirt and so we were like you just just go anywhere and get an off-white and he's like no no no, that's the brand how yeah. old are you guys like, yeah yeah i didn't know that i'm not living on the cutting edge of uh, of fashion i've no, nobody who would look at me would think that either I hate it, but listen look at you got better hair than me at least you're doing something <laughs> right i'm 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 i've become that I, I i was telling some friends a funny story um a few months ago at my company we did a 80s day Dress oh, yeah. like yeah. dress like you're in the 1980s, and I went home and I talked to my wife and I said, "Lisa, um, do I have any 80s <laughs> clothing?" And, and her response was both biting and made me proud. She said, "Sean, all your clothes are from the 80s. You really <laughs> haven't haven't matured your wardrobe." And and I was thinking, yeah, I'm uh, somehow I've fallen out of a little bit of touch of what's hip it's come track. back. It's come yeah. back. <laughs> that's that's the, the thing that I've learned as I've got older. You just got to hold on for long enough and the cycle comes back. So don't throw anything out. That, it's the skinny tie comes back. And it's no different than the markets, right? Like we were just talking about BP and we're talking about Chipotle. And, you know, we talk about whoever it was that had the Toyota or whoever had the, the, the pedal scare. Um, things come back if you've got a patient time horizon i happen to be waiting around for clothing to come back to the 1980s i've waited 20 some years it's coming back so you know i, th I think I, I, I think it's back you might even you might even be on the tail end of that trend you got to get it out of the closet and wear it now otherwise you'll miss it <laughs> we, yeah we were around in the in the kind of the the light the 90s kind of power suit phase with the really big shoulders and lots of material yeah, I, I was, although I, I quickly I quickly moved into startup land, which startup land hasn't really changed this wardrobe. I got a big boy shirt on today, but I'm <laughs> usually I'm usually in a in a T shirt and it usually says the name of my company on it and uh uh, and and I'm trying to look hip and young, and I have my van shoes on, like you guys are wearing in California. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, I've, I've gotten a few gray hairs, and uh, I've gotten a little older. Yeah, so vans is something that that is my generation. That's that's kind of a '90s kids thing, and uh, that yeah, happy to see that come back again. Um, just tell me a little bit about when you've got uh, just when you when you're working with a client an example of how that that process happens or, or, or an example client um well we we try to first of all um we let them contact us for the most part um we we try not to be uh too aggressive in reaching out to people who are real busy trying to do their day jobs and bothering them but we hope by our, our good work in the market people have come to us and um, we try to quickly um, understand from clients which pain point is most important for them to solve in the near term and like I said you know if it's I want to do better research if it's a uh, I need to save three to four hours a week I'm going to uh, all these different sources for data and, and my spreadsheets I'm constantly trying to update them with market information that's a an efficiency problem if the problem is I need to improve my client communications um, that's a different one. So we will understand what their problem is, and we'll try to set them on a curriculum. Well, first of all, take a, a few-week trial of our software, but then set them on a curriculum that makes them, and I'll repeat the word badass, that's a word we use a lot around here, makes them badass at solving that problem, but also opens their eyes to some other problems that they can solve without paying us an additional dollar. So what sort of other problems can you solve for them? Well, yeah, I mean, let's 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 talk about um, let's let's talk about an investment challenge. You know, um, let's say, you know, you and I were talking about maybe different or, or similar philosophies on investing, but let's say somebody had and acquires multiple 
um, bias, but also wanted to know what a fundamental score and also wanted to know uh, a Peter Lynch score. And they wanted to know the intersection of those. They said, hey, I'm not an investment genius, but, you know, I've read Tobias's books and, and, and done some research. I'd feel most comfortable going for the intersection of these three approaches. And we can show people how to screen on each of those and then how to find the intersection. And then once you've got that down to a list of three or four, how do you evaluate those three to four? I have, I have seen some of those charts. That's one of the things that I like most is that you get you can plot an earnings line against a market capitalization line or something like that so you can see if there's been if there's been a sell off you'll see that on the market capitalization line and if mm -hmm. the earnings are pretty steady when i when i very first started out there in a, this is in australia there was this i've told this story a few times so i apologize to anybody who's <laughs> heard this one before but we had the way that we invested we had this phone book sized uh, and that phone book again that was something that used to exist before Google. But... <laughs> can you pause and remind <laughs> what that is yeah so that was but this thing this thing was like that pulpy paper and they had every company listed on the asx and basically the way that we invested is we just went they just plot like the last 10 years of earnings and the last and the stock price over the last 10 years and the way that we picked them was when the the market capitalization line had fallen but the earnings were still in a pretty good trajectory. We'd, we'd buy those stocks. That's a pretty effective investment strategy. So I was very happy to see you, yeah. you can do that with the white charts. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't know if you're seeing a lot of this. Um, we started talking about technology as it relates to financial services and, and, and how uh, the financial services space is behind. Um, it's interesting, though, as technology is getting applied more and more. You, you look at something like model portfolios, right? And, and they came into existence to make life easier for advisors and individual investors, right? Hey, um, you don't have to be an expert. You may want more sophistication than picking a single ETF or, or, or a set of funds. Um, subscribe to my model. Well, what we've seen now is, you know, there are 10,000 plus commercial models out there. It, which creates yet another challenge, which is what's the right one for me? How do I even evaluate, you know, how do I find the needle in the haystack? Yeah, it's well, easy that's a good question. It. How do you do that? Well, that's that's the thing we're having a lot of fun with now is, um, you know, we have the ability to ingest some models that you want to compare. We, we There isn't a market yet for a single data provider who's got all the fundamental statistics and holdings for 10,000 models. We've got some of that data. Um, but you either want to create your own model or you want to ingest commercial ones and the characteristics, we can then help you evaluate them. You know, what's the return? What's the fees? What's the, the um, uh, what are the risk characteristics? What are the exposure? You know, you, you don't want China exposure for whatever reason because you have a thesis about tariffs. How do you compare these so that you can pick the right 60-40 model, 70-30 model? You know, whether you're active or passive in your investment approach, we think there's always a need um, to be able to do side by sides and to be able to screen from lots to just a few. Have you looked at that specifically? The the sixty forty. What's what's the what's the future of sixty forty? Because we've sort of it feels to me that we've the forty has uh, they're both pretty expensive. They're both sides of that equation look like that. There's not much juice left in them. Yeah, you know, you know, here in you know, the it, it's tough to make money on the the forty side of things, and um, you know, with all that's going on with the interest rates. So I, I think we, you know, and I think somebody like um, you know, a lot of people on social media are sixty forty is dead. Right. Um, I I think that's an easy thing to say in the eleventh year of a bull market. I think. Um, when you get into a bearish market, I think there's going to be a reappreciation for a 60/40 type of model. It's hard. It's it's one of those uh, like uh, it's been declared dead numerous times over the last mm. five years, and it's it's if it's done very well over the last five years. It's, mm. it's just I don't think anybody could have foreseen interest rates uh, where they are with negative interest yeah. rates all around the world. So I don't yeah. know if the US can go negative as well. Do you have a do you have a view on that? Can the US go negative? Uh, I, I don't have a personal view on that, um, except the very concept is one that I, I have a hard time wrapping my mind yeah, it around. It doesn't make but, sense. Yeah. Why do you think that 
it makes more sense elsewhere than it makes sense here. I don't know that it does. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I have this, uh, you know, this is unsupported by the data. I, I don't, I mean, I don't have any, I don't have any empirical view on it. I just think that um, higher interest rates do in fact tend to make the economy work a little bit better because I think that that makes some investment options look more interesting than others. If you suppress the interest rates, you get, it has a variety of knock-on effects. And I think that some of the malaise in Europe is as a result of having very low interest rates, not not, mm. not the other way around. You know, they seem to have low interest rates because of the malaise, but I think that it, the chicken and egg thing might be back to front. Yeah, yeah I tell you, in my house, I, I got a, a paper bank statement. Don't ask me why I still receive paper yeah. bank statements somehow as a technologist, but I got a paper bank statement and I, I did have a real appreciation for earning I think 11 cents interest <laughs> on, on my, my savings here's balance. Here's your $15 over. fee and here's 11 <laughs> cents in interest. <laughs> so I, I was explaining to my kids why it still makes sense to keep money in places like banks, you, you know, a, a, as low as the interest rates are. And I, I got to tell them the story of Great Depressions and sticking money in mattresses and, and things like that. And um, But uh, more and more it's, uh, you know, the – People have the fear of missing out on the market, eh? fear of missing out on Bitcoin, fear of missing out on FANG, fear right. of missing out on on a, a raging bull market in year number 11. And, um, you know, I see a lot more aggressive portfolios now. Um, right. I hope everybody has their downside risk appropriately managed or at least expectations that this could change quickly. And I yeah. think that's the, the role of a, a great asset manager or wealth advisor is to help people understand that stuff. Yeah, I think that's right. It's it's been it's been a particularly tough time, I think, for anybody who's a little bit risk managed. Because if you if you haven't been the, exposed to the S and P five hundred, which is the best performed asset, if you like, in the entire yep. world for the last decade, then you've kind of underperformed. And so if you've had a value bent, or you've hedged, or you've gone international, or anything else that's not just straight long the market, then you you've underperformed, and so you look like an idiot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the and and we see asset managers who say, yeah, I, if you put me on a trend line, that's how I look. But what I like to show when I'm defending my services is, you know, let's look at the max drawdown now, and and I actually am managing that downside risk based on my drawdown profile. So if I can get an enlightened client or prospect who says, yeah, I may sacrifice a point or two on the upside. But on the downside, I feel like that downside risk is mitigated appropriately. Um, it, it's all hypothetical now because, uh, again, memories fade, and uh, I, I don't That's think right. that I, I don't think that many people still have a, a fresh memory of the late '90s and 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 some things that made portfolios drop dramatically in a matter of weeks. Right. So there aren't um, that many people it, around who even saw the 2007-9 drawdown, which is that's not that long ago. I know, I know, and and it's, you know, it's it, it, it's one of those things. We did a a survey of people who are advised. We um, and and this is a strange one. We we surveyed and it ended up being we got 666 respondents, <laughs> and and I got really. <laughs> jittery get when, one when more I, please guys go get one one more piece of feedback but we heard just some pretty damning um feedback that i rarely hear from my advisor and um and an appreciation for the fact that if i don't hear from my advisor that makes me not want to recommend them that makes me not comfortable with my financial plans and that makes me uh, increasingly likely to churn Right. Well, guess what? No, nobody's churning in a rising tide, right? right. Everybody's just, just saying, ah, I got another good statement, honey. Let's let's plan a trip to Florida. Um, it'll be really interesting once things get shaky, um, you know, back to why we're focused on advisor communication is an additional problem we're helping them solve is um, that's becoming a real challenge going forward. And, you know, I, I, I don't hope on a personal level, I absolutely don't hope for uh, a bear market. But uh, I do know when that bear market comes, uh, advisors need some help. When uh, can we talk about white charts? The firm. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, so, are you are you privately owned? What's what's the uh, what's the ownership structure? We're, we're ten years old. We are privately owned, venture backed. 
Right. Um, but we, you know, we haven't made it a, a practice to go get repeated rounds of funding. The last round of funding we took in was uh, 2015. Right. Um, one of our backers is a Strategic Morningstar, mm-hmm. um, but uh, largely Chicago and London-based uh, venture capital or or seed funding companies. So you're you're a software as a service fintech. So that'd be a pretty that's a nice little niche to be in right now. Yeah, um, it, but we're a little quirky though in that we're, we're hugely digital in a really cool space, but we're also very brick and mortar uh, focused in terms of interactions with our customers. We just think our, our, our target customer base, busy people, uh, various problems, uh, we don't want to make it difficult for them to get our help. So one of the things I think that's that I, I pride myself in and that we do a lot of is real easy to chat with us from our platform, real easy to find a phone number. Everybody knows the name of their account manager. And we have a, a large team that's focused on helping. So cool digital platform, but you know, one of those where, where we pride ourselves on actually people to people interaction, which I suppose, you know, some private equity firm would say, no, no, you need to be all digital. Scale. Um, yeah, we're, we're pretty darn happy with, uh, with helping our customers in the way they want to be helped. How many employees in the firm? Quickly approaching 60. I think as of today, we're 58. And uh, we're spread between Chicago and Manhattan uh, with a few remote employees too. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good uh, that number. That's like half that Gladwell number that he says, like 120 was the size of your yeah. your tribe yeah. or something like that. My my wife, uh, you live out on the West Coast. I I grew up in Manhattan Beach. Oh yeah, really. Out, out not too far away. And and my wife keeps saying, is is there any time in the near future where you'll be opening a LA okay. office yeah. and <laughs> And I, I unfortunately say no, but maybe I'll go visit my uh, my friend Tobias at some point in time. Yeah, I'll, I'll come sub some space for you, <laughs> from you when you do that. Manhattan Beach is a really nice spot. I think uh, Meb favors out in uh, – he's, he's close by. He's in uh, El Segundo, Manhattan Beach, around there somewhere. It's a good spot. It is. Did, did, do your parents still own property out there? No, but they they, cer- they they certainly <laughs> wish they did. And I, I do have a younger sibling who still lives there and – um, she's she's uh, in her mid thirties and looking to buy a house, and she's saying, "Wow, this oh, man, is a, tough. A, a, a difficult path." But I tell her, "Come back to the Midwest. Um, you know, property value is a little bit better, and uh, we got those cold winters, which means you can just work twenty four by seven, yeah, just right. focusing on your career every day if you want to." Yeah, that's the problem with when Manhattan Beach. There's always a nice wave just out there you can go and catch. <laughs> yes, there is. So, are you? Did you grow up in California? Uh, until I was about 13 and then, um, a very transient family lived in a lot of different States. My dad was an executive that we, we ended up relocating a lot, eventually ended up in my senior year of high school or what do you call it in Australia? What do high you call school. High, high school. Okay. You call it university though. Oh, that's cool. Oh. So college is university. Yeah. 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 So, uh, ended up moving to the Midwest, my senior year of high school. And you, where, where'd you do your MBA? Stanford. Not yeah. a little bit north of you. When, when did you graduate from that? Uh, Tobias, you, you can ask a man these questions. A man <laughs> yes, you can. Already... It's a, you can't ask a woman these questions. I can ask you. <laughs> uh, in 1997. So that's a pretty exciting time to be at Stanford. That was right close to the very top of the, uh, the dot-com boom. Oh yeah, it was. It was. You know, I mean, it was right when email was was making its charge. It was when Google was was coming out. It was you know classmates that started the you know the service Evite. Yeah. Um, you know, and and, and uh, Invisalign. The you know the, yeah. the just technology and brick and mortar and um, you know the social media and everything was just coming about then, and. It also was a really interesting time to be an individual investor too, right? Those were the days where you know you you bought Cisco and and, right. and all all of these stocks that could only go up and up and up, and then until they didn't. I'm envious. I think that if you were going to go to any school, if I was going to go to any school in the states, I think I'd want to go to Stanford because you get a really good football team. The weather is spectacular, just because it's it's not San Francisco weather. It's that uh, it's warmer and it's pretty clear most of the time, yeah. and it's it's basically it's an it's an east it's a west coast ivy, I think. 
Yeah, and I was actually out there. The cool thing for me is I was out there the same two years that Tiger Woods was an undergrad. He went to undergrad two years, two years at Stanford, and I was there those two years. So my friends and I, while we should have been studying, would go sit on a hill with a six-pack of beer, sit on a hill and watch him far outdrive any drives we could have made on that same golf course. Yeah, that's amazing. So, and then he just he just exploded from there. So that was right before he took off. Yes, yeah. It was, so it was, it, you concur. It was a fantastic time to be out there in a neat place in Silicon Valley to kind of get my career kicked off. And is that what made you a kind of uh, software as a service online kind of tech guy? Do you think? Yeah, I got a call. Um, I was doing strategy consulting in, in some boardrooms, and I, I got a call from some guys back in Chicago I had met right out of undergrad who said, uh, hey, you got an MBA now. Um, why, why don't you, <laughs> you're why don't you come back? And, yeah, you're legit. Why don't you come back and help us grow this company called Tolution? And I said, I don't really uh, know how to run a company, but I, I, I love the idea. What are you paying? And they said, uh, oh, <laughs> equity. <laughs> equity. <laughs> and they said equity, and I and I went to my then girlfriend, now wife, and I said, "Honey, um, got the opportunity to go work at this my first software startup, and um, have to leave this high-paying consulting job and have a whole lot of student loans, but I want to do it." And she said, "Oh, great! Is it is it a step forward economically?" And I said, "Not in the short term. No, it's it's probably not a good move." And I've told this story before, but that that's when I knew I was going to marry my wife, Lisa. Is uh, she said. If you're passionate about it, let's go out to the Midwest and let's give up a paycheck for a while and let's let's see how you do as an entrepreneur. And did it work out? It worked out great. It worked out great. We ended up uh, growing that one of the first SaaS software companies in Chicago it was focused on the telecom industry. We we grew it, sold it to a public company, and uh, that was the uh, a key step in my journey. Oh, that's a great story. What 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 did the business do? What did the business do? It was. Um, kind of it, it was an enterprise application for small telcos so there was a, a, a stage I where see. there was these things called CLEX and it was a billing customer care order management SaaS based software package and Mark Benioff was kind of out there starting salesforce.com but there weren't a whole lot of people talking about software as a service which we then used to call ASP application service provider so right. we got that going in Chicago it, it did well and and uh led to a nice uh, nice outcome for our employees. I come from a telecom background. I worked as a general counsel in a, in a telco that it was all uh, infrastructure. So it was all uh, dark fiber data centers, appearing, uh, fi- uh, appearing layer and a subsea cable. So I have a little bit of an understanding. It's, a, it's like, like a little bit like finance. It's highly regulated, uh, yes. interesting business. Yeah, it, 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 and it's, it was the same value prop um, for the telecom space as we now have for the investment research space. There were big, massive solutions available you know, for telecom providers as an enterprise package. We figured it was a, a better way to put together data and software and make a great user experience in the telco industry. Um, I'm just bringing a few pages of that playbook to us in the um, financial services investment research space. I appreciate it. If uh, if folks want to get in contact with you, or they want to try out some of Ychart's stuff, what's the? What, how do they do that? Uh, Ychart's dot com. Come uh, come there. Sign up for a free trial. Explore it at your own pace. Um, and you can find us all over social media. And what's your what's your Twitter handle? I always try to get the Twitter handle out of everybody. Give you a bump in the followers. Oh, I, I appreciate that. I'm I'm Sean underscore Ychart's. Um, and um, yeah, love love people to follow me. And, and the only you know, I, I'm not a, a salesperson. Um, I like to at night um, come up with ideas, and I post a lot of charts. Um, everything from what's the impact of a Trump tweet on the market <laughs> to things like I mentioned earlier, which is corporate crises. To hey, what happened? To, is it even make any sense to invest in IPOs anymore, given all of these bombs? I do that regularly, so would would love to have people follow me, and I promise I won't be pitching software. Yeah, you're a good follower. I appreciate it. Sean Brown, President, CEO of YCharts, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Tobias.